Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome once more into silence, today into green silence, the silence of gardens. Um, thank you all very much um, for being with us. Um, now this afternoon uh, we have an hour and we're going to divide it into three sections. First of all I'm going to read prose and poetry about 17th century English gardens um, then Stephen Yeo is going to read poems about gardens, silence and Quakerism. And finally, Susan Mariam Rosita is going to read a poem about silence in Armenian gardens. Um, after each of the readings, there'll be time for you to make comments and ask questions. And please do this um, by using the YouTube chat facility. But before the readings, though, before we start all that, um, let's actually hold the silence together. So um, for those of you who don't know, I'm um, Kate McLaughlin, I'm Professor of English Literature at the University of Oxford, and I'm currently working on a literary history of silence. Um, and one of the chapters I've most enjoyed working on um, has been on rural retreats in the 17th and early 18th centuries. And this afternoon, I just wanted to share some of that literature with you. It's really beautiful. Um, the chapter is actually largely about um, feelings of defeat um, when you've experienced such a reversal of political and military fortunes that all you really want to do is sit and look at a field. Um, and in the second half of the 17th century and the early 18th century, those who experienced such defeat included royalists during the government of Oliver Cromwell, Republicans after the restoration of Charles II, so-called non-jurors who refused to swear the oaths of allegiance to William and Mary after the Glorious Revolution, Whigs under Queen Anne and Tories under George I. And political and military defeat had enormous ramifications. Many individuals were led to question their understanding of God's providence and revise their assumptions about what constituted a good life. Some who had been prominent figures in national life quit the public sphere altogether. So the poet Abraham Cowley withdrew to village life in Surrey and Mild May Fain, the second Earl of Westmoreland, also a poet, slunk back to his country seat, Apethorpe Palace in Northamptonshire. But as well as being a practical necessity um, or even a legal obligation, rural retirement was a concept of living with a distinguished literary and philosophical heritage. Epicureanism and Stoicism, the works of Horace and Virgil, these in particular recommended the quiet country life, influencing the adoption of leisured rural existence well into the 18th century. Um, the Latin term for this kind of leisured rural existence is utium, and I'm going to mention that later. At the same time, um, botany and horticultural science were developing apace, and we begin to see serious thinking about what to grow where and when. So there's a wonderful mixture here of scientific thought religious feeling and personal luxuriation in the joys of gardens. So my first reading is going to be from um, writing by the lawyer, politician, philosopher and father of empiricism, Francis Bacon, Viscount St Alban. Um, 
pre-Civil War, exact, uh, obviously, um, but Bacon knew political defeat. When he was serving as Lord Chancellor, he fell into debt and his enemies brought further charges against him. He was imprisoned and declared incapable of holding office in future. So he knew what it was like to, 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 to be thrust out of public office, as it were. So I'm going to read now from Bacon's 1625 essay of God. God Almighty first planted a garden, and indeed it is the purest of human pleasures. It is the greatest refreshment to the spirits of man, without which buildings and palaces are but gross handiworks, and a man shall ever see that when ages grow to civility and elegancy, men come to build stately sooner than to garden finely, as if gardening were the greater perfection. Later in the essay, um, Bacon um, gives this marvellous passage about what to grow when. And he did this after trial and error in his own garden. Um, and it's just a beautiful piece of prose. It's a simple listing, um, but it makes you really think through the seasons and the beauties of what you can see in a garden. I do hold it in the royal ordering of gardens. There ought to be gardens for all the months in the year, in which severally things of beauty may be then in season. For December and January and the latter part of November, you must take such things as are green all winter. Holly, ivy, bays, juniper, cypress trees, yew, pineapple trees, fir trees, rosemary, lavender, periwinkle, the white, the purple and the blue, germander, which is an aromatic shrub, flags, which I think are irises, orange trees, lemon trees and myrtles, and sweet marjoram, warm set. There followeth for the latter part of January and February, the Mazerian tree, which is a kind of woody shrub like a Daphne, which then blossoms, crocus vernus, both the yellow and the grey, primroses, anemones, the early tulip, the hyacinthus orientalis, Cameris fritillaria. For March there come violets, especially the single blue, which are the earliest, the yellow daffodil, the daisy, the almond tree in blossom, the peach tree in blossom, the cornelian tree, which is a kind of cherry tree, sweet briar. In April follow the double white violet, the wallflower, the stock gillyflower, the cowslip, fleur de luce and lilies of all natures, rosemary flowers, the tulip, the double peony, the pale daffodil, the French honeysuckle, the cherry tree in blossom, the damascene and plum trees in blossom, the white thorn in leaf, the lilac tree. In May and June come pinks of all sorts, especially the blush pink, roses of all kinds except the musk, which comes later, honeysuckles, strawberries, bugloss, columbine, the French marigold, floss africanus, cherry fruit tree in fruit, ribes, which is sorrel, figs in fruit, rasps, which are raspberries, vine flowers, lavender in flower, the sweet satyrian with the white flower, herba muscaria, lilium, convallium, which is lily of the valley, the apple tree in blossom. In July come gilly flowers of all varieties, musk roses, the lime tree in blossom, early pears and plums in fruit, genetings, which are a kind of apple, codlins, which are another kind of apple. In August come plums of all sorts in fruit, pears, apricots, barberries, filberts, muskmelons, monkshoods of all colours. In September come grapes, apples, poppies of all colours, peaches, melocotones, nectarines, cornelians, wardens, which are a type of pear, quinces. In October and the beginning of November come services, medlars, bullaces, which are a type of plum, roses cut or removed to come late, hollyoaks and such like. These particulars are for the climate of London, but by my meaning is perceived that you may have ver perpetuum, that is perpetual spring, as the place affords. So my second writer is John Evelyn. Um, Evelyn's known for his diary, which he kept for 66 years. Um, Evelyn was educated in Oxford at Balliol College, briefly joined the Royalist Army, but spent the Civil War largely in Europe. Um, when he returned, um, he refused employment in the Commonwealth. He was an ardent gardener with a particular love for trees. And I'm going to read an extract from a letter he wrote to the polymath Sir Thomas Brown on the 28th of January, 1657 in which he sets out his vision for a kind of college of gardening professors. So in this letter, Evelyn speaks of, quote, his 
abhorrency of those painted and formal projections of our Cockney gardens and plots, which appear like gardens of pasteboard and march pane, that's marzipan, and smell more of paint than of flowers and verdure. Our drift is a noble, princely and universal Elysium, capable of all the amenities that can naturally be introduced into gardens of pleasure, and such as may stand in competition with all the august designs and stories of this nature, either of ancient or modern times, yet so as to become useful and significant to the least pretenses and faculties. And he continues, quote, we will endeavour to show how the air and genius of gardens operate upon human spirits towards virtue and sanctity. I mean in a remote preparatory and instrumental working. How caves, grots, mounts and irregular ornaments of gardens do contribute to contemplative and philosophical enthusiasm. How Elysium, Antrim, Nemus, Paradisus, Hortus, Lucas, etc. signify all of them rem sacram et divinam, say so something sacred and divine. For these expedients do influence the soul and spirits of man and prepare them for converse with good angels, besides which they contribute to the less abstracted pleasures, philosophy natural and longevity. And I would have not only the elegies and elegies of the ancient and famous garden heroes, but a society of the paradisi cultores, that's the tillers or cultivators of paradise, persons of ancient simplicity, Paradisian and Hortulan saints, to be a society of learned and ingenious men, such as Dr. Brown, by whom we might hope to redeem the time that has been lost in pursuing vulgar errors and still propagating them, as so many bold men do yet presume to do. And finally, I would like to read from Andrew Marvel's poem, The Garden of 1661. Um, now, Marvel loved the colour green. Um, his initial political sympathies were royalist, but he came to accept and work for the Republican regime. He was very adaptable. His biographer, uh, John Aubrey, said of him, he was in conversation very modest and of very few words. And these traits are evident in the poems he wrote exploring Otium, inspired by the country estates of Nun Appleton in North Yorkshire and Winchenden and Woburn in Buckinghamshire. So Marvel came to Nun Appleton in 1550 as the tutor of Mary Fairfax. Mary's father was Sir Thomas Fairfax, um, the renowned commander in chief of the New Model Army. In June 1650, Fairfax had been assigned to lead the invasion of Scotland, um, but he refused to do that because there'd been no provocation from the Scots. So he resigned from public life and for the rest of the interregnum, he lived quietly at his Yorkshire estates. So Otium at Fairfax's Nun Appleton was not only a subject of intellectual interest, but it was a way of life. So here are one, two, three, four, five stanzas from Andrew Marvell's The Garden, 1661. How vainly men themselves amaze to win the palm, the oak or bays, and their incessant labours see, crowned from some single herb or tree whose short and narrow verged shade does prudently their toils upbraid, while all flowers and all trees do close to weave the garlands of repose. Fair quiet have I found thee here, and innocence, my sister, thy sister dear. Mistaken long I sought you then in busy companies of men. Your sacred plants, if here below, only among the plants will grow. Society is all but rude to this delicious solitude. When we have run our passion's heat, love hither makes his best retreat. The gods that mortal beauty chase still in a tree did end their race. Apollo hunted Daphne so, only that she might laurel grow. And Pan did after Syrinx speed, not as a nymph, but for a reed. What wondrous life in this I lead. Ripe apples drop about my head. The luscious clusters of the vine upon my mouth do crush their wine. The nectarine and curious peach into my hands themselves do reach. Stumbling on melons as I pass, ensnared with flowers I fall on grass. Meanwhile, the mind from pleasures less withdraws into its happiness. The mind that ocean where each kind does straight its own resemblance find. Yet it creates transcending these far other worlds and other seas, annihilating all that's made to a green thought 
in a green shade. Thank, thank you, Kate, um, for this uh, beautiful reading. Um, we just, um, I just wanted to sh uh, say that we are actually looking out in the garden and um, uh, trees are waving towards us and it's really, really beautiful to see you on screen reading, you know, from a different century. But we have, you know, some of those trees we have shared with each other and I think that's, that's quite special. Another note is that our internet is very in unstable. So some of the things that we are going to say and we are going to read to, to you today um, are probably going to be very fragmented and you can't hear but I think on in a session on silence maybe that's even appropriate um, but just so you know that our internet sometimes doesn't work um, and I hope that you will understand us but I want to just um, ask the audience if you would like to ask a question about uh, about the readings that Kate has just done uh, please um, do so in the chat function um, on YouTube. But meanwhile, I think um, Steve, Stephen would like to ask a question or the first question um, on, um, on Kate's reading. Well, Kate, I, I loved the readings and I especially warmed to the parallel between the 17th and, and our present times, particularly with reference to defeat and how one responds to defeat. And I thought this may be a strange connection, but there's a big difference between defeat and failure, as it were, and analyzing the difference is interesting. I wonder what you thought about that. And also I love the response of making lists. Yeah. Your first reading, the litany, as it were, of a list is very comforting in moments of defeat, like the ones we're living through now from a, from a left point of view of any kind, from a democratic point of view. So yeah. anyway, thank you very much. And yeah. if you'd like to talk a bit, a bit more about defeat, I would welcome it. Um, I think so. I think that's a, um, a fascinating point, Stephen, and um, a brilliant question. So uh, we're talking about people on both sides in the Civil War and later um, who who believed um, hugely in their cause. I mean, it, it was possibly even worse than the culture wars today of all the, you know, on uh, Remainers versus Leavers, because they actually took to arms. Um, and so ha having been through Brexit and, and, and subsequent events, we have a sort of sense of what it's like. Um, and you're right in the sense that it's not, it's not about failure, it's about defeat. And it's about then working out what you what you do and how you can sort of live a good life on the losing side and how you can yeah make the most of it I suppose so there are elements of stoicism in this there are elements of Christian patience so the stoicism coming from more from a classical tradition but Christian patience as well the idea of um, uh, putting up with things as a form of religious work um, and there's also a sense, a philosophical sense circling around these writers about um, to be useful to society. Do you have to be Lord Chancellor or Prime Minister or leader of an army? Can you be useful to society if you're sitting at home in your garden? And of course, it, uh, class issues are involved in this because no, not everybody has a lovely country estate to which they can retire surrounded by melons and peaches. Um, but there's a sense, actually, that withdrawing, living the good life, thinking about poetry and philosophy is actually a, a form of contribution, that you are, in some sense, contributing still to public life, though you've, though you've withdrawn from the national stage, you're still contributing to public life. Um, you could go beyond that and question, well, if I do absolutely nothing and I don't bother philosophizing or gardening or writing poetry, am I still contributing? I, am I still living the good life? That's maybe a harder argument to make. Um, I'm really glad you liked Bacon's list because when I read that, it seems to me pure poetry and there's, it has a great sort of rhythm to it. Yeah. Um, and just the sense, the idea of perpetual spring, but it's it's not even necessarily spring. It's just about the joys of every single month. And, you know, even in winter, there are things that you can be looking at. There's the there are the ivy and the holly, etc. Um, so it seemed to me that um, for someone um, if who, I can just... Yeah. 
just to j jump in with the list too, I think it's quite, I mean, two points actually here. What's quite remarkable about the list, he's making a list of things that are no more, but will be again, right? Um, yes. I think that's quite special. Um, I think making a list of nature is, is that because usually you make a list of things like if you think about, for example, the many, many lists that uh, Marcel Proust uh, wrote in his life. I mean, he had a whole, you know, uh, ending, unending uh, register of things that are no more, but um, making lists of, um, of nature, mm. uh, things that appear in nature are not lists that are mm. actually of things that are no more, but just, you know, something to look forward to, but also there is this idea of looking forward to and mourning at the same time, which mm. I think is quite, um, uh, quite special. So that's, uh, that's just a point that I wanted to make there. But um, on the subject of, um, of defeat, I'm thinking about this wonderful essay about the ordinary by Georges Perec, um, who was an, a French philosopher of the 1970s. And in that essay, he writes, it's um, count your, your, your teaspoons. And if you can, then you know that you live at peace because the ordinary, of course, disappears when you live um, you, you, you live in, um, in war or, you know, now we are, of course, surrounded by a lot of wars, whether it is in Syria or whether it's now in Palestine. And there, in mm -hmm. situations like that, you cannot no longer count your, your, your teaspoons and, um, and, and count that ordinariness. Um, you really need to have privilege. So you are um, the poets that you're presenting to us, they have, I think it's both beautiful that they call for a good life that is beyond you know, something that you can measure on, you know, on a ladder of success. But then on the other hand, they can only do it, as you pointed out, because they have estates, right? For the normal people during that time, they probably couldn't sit down and make, you know, mm. uh, count the, you know, as I now mm. say, you know, the ordinariness of teaspoons. Um, yeah. So anyway, just two little French notes here. Yes, I also just saw a question um, from the audience. Um, by Philip Roderick, and he said, um, could you say a little bit more about Otium? Yes, sure. So um, on the point of um, nature coming again, so it's a morning, but it's a looking forward. There can't be a better subject for political defeat because you think, well, eventually the political pendulum will swing and the sunny days will come again. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, on the question of um, Otium, um, so otium is a classical concept um, going back to the ancient Greeks, and it was um, something that both the Stoics and the Epicureans thought about and wrote about. And although there were different inflections from both schools, um, so Epicureans thought very much to enjoy the lovely life and almost be like hedonists, well, very much be like hedonists, Stoics have a sort of more austere outlook. Um, but both thought that um, otium or leisure um, should have a, cer a certain contributive um, element to it. So in other words, um, the philosophy by which they included what we would think of as science, so natural philosophy, so studying plants um, and trees, for example, and um, creativity, whether that's writing poetry or song, were thought to be important elements of, of otium. So the Stoics, I think, emphasised more the emphasis to public life, because it was sort of if um, people were able to, to sit in leisure and create poetry and think things through, then everybody would benefit. The Epicureans were more, well, hadn't quite got the same emphasis on contribution to public life, but still thought it's not just a matter of sitting there doing nothing. Um, there's, there is this element of, of creativity in it. The word I like, the translation I like of Otium is ease. Yes, yes. I love that exactly. word. Yes, yes. It yes. covers the whole spectrum, I think, from laziness to leisure to relaxation to ease. Um, Miriam, just to pick up what you said about counting the teaspoons, it reminds me of um, there's a phrase that Osip Mandelstam, the Russian poet, had, which was, uh, no, sorry, his wife, Nadezhda Mandelstam, um, the ordinary, the privilege of ordinary heartbreak. So in, in Russia, in the worst times of Stalin, um, they actually looked back on, with nostalgia on, you know, just 
normal sad events like people dying in families it wasn't that everybody was terrified all the time and people were you know taken off in the middle of the night so that privilege of ordinary heartbreak seems to chime with the the Mm -hmm. i'm I'm so so glad that you mentioned this and uh, we 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 can take this up again because of course i'm going to read um, um, an armenian poem um, (laughs) that is both about soviet armenia but also armenia as it is now um later during uh, during today's reading session but i would like just have having my eye on so sad to leave your session now a section now Kate but I'm sure we can bring it together at the end um, mm-hmm. I would just like to give um, at the microphone or better the silence um, over to Stephen and maybe we can just ground ourselves again a little bit and then um, a bit a bit of silence in between and then you speak whenever you uh, you you feel moved to um, and um, yeah thank you thank you Kate and also Philip thank you for the for the question Silence, poems, gardens. Let's see if we can make some kind of a connection, links between them. And I want to thank you in advance for listening to what an anthology of Quaker poems once called The Speaking Silence. The book was called The Speaking Silence. Because I guess we know about or feel or belong in some sense to silence, in part only through sound, noise. Silence is one of those five sacreds that I seem to remember W.H. Auden once listed. Five sacreds known through their opposites, yes. I think the five were God, (laughs) silence, death. Kindness. No, no. God, silence, death, nothingness, and dark. And I especially myself um, uh, like and gain from shallow silence, silence which is interrupted and enhanced by sound. I used to love going to a Quaker meeting in a community centre in Loughborough. And the Quaker meeting, the Quaker 50 minutes or an hour was always interrupted by that lovely sound of bottles being poured into rubbish containers. You know, huge great rubbish bin of bottles. And somehow actually that contributed to the silence. And so I wrote, soon after going to one of those meetings, a poem which I called In the Shallows, which I'd like to read. And it began in my head, crossing the garden to get to the Quaker meeting house in 43 St. Giles. In the Shallows, question mark. Right ear cocked. Same side eye, not quite looking, as a tentative bird approaches another, he pecks for the quick of silence. Garden gravel, limpid puddle, to weekly meeting where friends sit, four square, a tight unbroken ocean, making love from nothing. They look, he sees, not at each other's eyes, but with. Around this well, everyone equal, no whites, all pupils, 
old buckets on worn-out velvet ropes go much, much too deep. Lids close. Within such waters, earlobes look like fins. Him, him, it, us, us, she. But when is we? Leonard? Anna? A guide dog slurps his water. Two clicks. The thermostat at last? Or was it the electric clock? Ecstatic rummaging. Deep inside a leather bag, a member touches keys, then coins. India paper pages leafed through, crackle like straw, catching fire. There is wonderful writing about gardens and silence in a book that some of uh, listeners, contributors may know by Sue Stewart Smith, who is a psychiatrist married to a garden designer, a book called The Well-Gardened Mind. And I'm just minded to read a paragraph from this, if I may. She writes, like a suspension in time, the protected space of a garden allows our inner and the outer world to coexist free from the pressures of everyday life. Gardens in this sense offer us an in-between space, which can be a meeting place between our innermost dream-infused selves and the real physical world. This kind of blurring of boundaries is what the psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott called a transitional area of experience. This conceptualization of transitional process was to some extent influenced by Wordsworth and his understanding of how we inhabit the world through a combination of perception and imagination. We can get back to that, um, if we like, in our conversations. I like the connection of Winnicott and Wordsworth. But I'd like to read um, a poem people will probably already know uh, by Louise Gluck called The Wild Iris. I don't fully understand this poem. And I would say I don't fully understand most poems that I really like and love. I think this poem, I know this poem is about a plant listed as flag in at the um, first contribution that Kate made. And I think it's a plant, in fact, I know it's a plant whose roots are, are above ground in part, as well as under. And I think the poem is about being silenced. It's a terrifying poem in lots of ways. And the desperation, which women will well know about that, about being silenced in some male company, but also about the wonderful satisfaction about the silent center we all have. Anyway, enough of my stuff about this poem. <laughs> Let me just read The Wild Iris. At the end of my suffering, there was a door. Hear me out. That which you call death, I remember. Overhead, noises, branches of the pine shifting, then nothing. The weak sun flickered over the dry surface. It is terrible to survive as consciousness buried in the dark earth. And it was over. That which you fear being a soul and unable to speak, ending abruptly, abruptly 
the stiff earth bending a little, and what I took to be birds darting in low shrubs. You who do not remember passage from the outer world, I tell you, I could speak again. Whatever returns from oblivion returns to find a voice. From the centre of my life came a great fountain, deep blue shadows on azure seawater. What a, what a line, incidentally, uh, came to me, what beauty it was when reading it, like so often until you articulate a poem. The weak sun flickered over the dry surface. What a line. Now, um, I wonder if I've got time to read one further poem. Of course, yeah. Uh, and it will be a poem by a poet who I've really come to admire hugely. And as much as I admire Alice Oswald, our professor of poetry, who I think is a discontinuous genius, as it were. <laughs> and incidentally, on Alice Oswald, please, if you're interested in any of this, get hold of a book by Alice Oswald called Of Weeds and Wildflowers. <laughs> it is a wonderful book. Um, and we could read the, the whole, we could spend the whole session on it. But anyway, Stollings um, lives in Greece and has lived there for years. And she's very different poet, but just as much of a genius. She uses a lot of rhyme, much less stream of consciousness, very formal. And she's a wonderful uh, writer. And she wrote this poem called Silence. <laughs> Silence has its own notation, dark jottings of duration, but not pitch. A long black box or little feathered hitch, like a new Greek letter or diacritical mark. Silence is a function of time. The lark in flight, but not in song, a nothing which keeps secrets or confesses. Pregnant, rich or awkward, cold. The pause that makes us hark. The space before or after. It's the room in which melody moves. The medium through which thought travels. It is golden, best. Welcome relief to talk-worn tedium. Before the word itself, it was the womb. It has a measure. Music calls it rest. And again, Incredible. again, when, when, when one actually is asked to read or labeled, allowed, if you like, to read something out loud, its magic is reinforced. Yes, absolutely. We spoke about that before the talk. <laughs> How wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for reading those and, and, and particularly reading your own. Um, there's um, a, a question has come in from Lydia Johnson, um, who says, Stephen, you said you don't understand the poem you read brilliantly. Would you say you connect with it more because you can interpret it as you like? Yes, and it's, yes, um, it's because it's suggestive rather than explanatory because it um, invites <coughs> reading and rereading, uh, because it gets to, in this particular poem, The Wild Iris, it gets to a nightmare zone, which is always possible to comfort, when, if you like, it's part of defeat, isn't it? When you're really, really defeated, ended, and that dread feeling that we can sometimes have about death, somehow a poem in that register invites you in and also gets you out at the same time in some way yeah comforting as Absolutely. well as scary yeah mm. um so um i think I, it, when i go to poetry readings or poetry discussions and somebody uh, very confident and very literate and very um well informed says what this poem is all about 
<laughs> is, yeah. or in a reading, something. What's that poem all about? And the very question offends me. Yeah, yeah. it's not all about anything. It's about mm. anyway. So it, it, it's, it's fascinating, like a snake. It's mesmerising. Yes. I think um, you've put your finger on another kind of silence in relation to poetry, which is the silence of interpretation, as in we don't always need to work out what it's all about. Um, mm. Of course, that's sort of my job. So I'm kind of talking myself out of a living being a, an English <laughs> literature professor. But there's um, some things that aren't explicable in terms of this is logically what it's all about. And that's why they're that's yeah. why they're poems. Um, Stephen may ask a question which is about um, in the shallows and how you and, and you wonderfully evoke how silence is constructed from sounds and, and almost becomes more beloved because of the mm. of the ambient sounds. Um, what what for you then is the difference between shallow and deep silence? Mm. What would deep silence be? I've tried to get it in that line about old buckets on worn out velvet ropes. Sometimes I find, and this is not just about Quaker meeting, when I go into silence, as it were, I go so deep that I'm near to sleep or actually asleep. And of course, snores are part of the noises off in a Quaker meeting full of old people. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, somehow um, there's a sort of, um, concrete uh, um, uh, sounds over which one has no control, just which happen, as it were, draw attention to the now, the immediacy, mm, the moment, mm -hmm. and they have their own rhythm. They are in themselves a kind of bit of um, electronic music, if you like, you know, sort of, 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 of um, the soundtracks. I don't know if anybody else is an enthusiast for films like um, films of Michelangelo Antonioni uh, of all that time ago, but... Um, I'm he... more thinking about the Japanese art, okay. you know, okay. about having the black color pointing towards towards the white space, okay. right? Yes. That's also yes. this... Um... Yes. Sometimes the sound, in the film, sometimes the soundtrack is enough for me. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, could, re I could listen to it again. Um, uh, uh, it's the, it's the interplay. Some some wise Quaker once said, of course, we don't worship silence. Mm. <laughs> no, <laughs> we, 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 we try to worship in silence. <laughs> mm. and, uh, um, so it's, yeah. the, it's the music of the interplay. The thing that Stallings mm. gets quite well, that lovely moment in a concert just before the first note. But I, I was just thinking about something else. Um, I'm also thinking, I mean, not only for us Quakers, but silence is always a self-confrontation, right? You confront yourself. And when you have an outside, you know, noise, it's that you are reminded that you're also part of a collective, right? So it's both this exposure to yourself, to oneself, but then being reminded that you're still part of, you know, of a community. So I think it's that interplay that uh, um, that works for me when I'm completely deep, as you described, mm. you know, in this meditative state, and then suddenly you hear something from outside. It makes you, you know, it holds you in a sense, right? Because um, mm. I don't know if this is a good explanation, mm. but yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, looking at the time, I think we should move on to Miriam. So, um, Miriam, thank you so much, Stephen, for those wonderful points. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, Miriam, would you like to, we'll um, have another silence and then you would like to start to read after that? Yeah. Um, 
So I'm I'm going to read something from um, an American Armenian poet called Peter Balakian. Um, it's an interesting poem. It's it's quite long. It has ten sections and. Um, why I chose it for me actually was the, the exercise of finding a poem about green space and silence and 21st um, century, uh, century Armenian poetry was really difficult because I realized that all poems and books written after the Armenian genocide, of course, somehow have to confront um, that tragedy. Um, for those of, uh, of us who don't know the Armenian genocide, it happened in 1915. Um, um, the Armenian nation um, was um, nearly completely killed off by, by the Ottomans, which was the prede uh, predecessor state of, um, of modern day Turkey. And it's a genocide that is still denied in, in Turkey. And so when you're looking at um, Armenian literature in the 20s and the 21st century, it's really difficult to find a poem that does not um, want to break that silence that comes, um, comes from, from the denial of the genocide. So. Um, looking at, at the poems and looking at the literature, I, I also realized, and this always happens when you encounter something difficult or something challenging, I realized that nature also has a different place for us and green spaces um, have a different space for us. I think nature is, 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 an, is, a, is our endless companion, not only in, in, in spaces of well-being and rest and, um, and pause, but of course nature is also witness to some of the tragedies of our lives. And um, so I try to choose a poem that um, kind of brings about this, this idea that we are, that we are always surrounded um, by our gardens and by our trees and by nature, um, um, regardless of what we are witnessing or experiencing. And the poem is, is really interesting because it is both about um, Peter Balakian um, as he lives and as he visits um, a little town that I lived in myself called Gümri in, in Armenia. And, um, and in the poem, he's driving through the countryside in Armenia from, from this little village, which is only 10 kilometers away from the Turkish border. Um, so it's, it's this really interesting kind of region of Armenia where you can actually look back to the old homeland um, from where the refugees, the survivors of the genocide came from, but you can't really reach it because the borders are closed. So this is one point that I want to give you before I'm reading the poem. And the other point is that he also remembers um, when a very big earthquake in Gumri in 1988 happened. Um, during that time, Armenia was still part of the Soviet Union. Um, um, Armenia got, um, got its formal independence in, in 1991. So yeah, let me just um, read it and um, let's see what, um, what you think. Near the Border by Peter Balakian. One. Over brandy at breakfast, we were talking about the Hellenic temple at the edge of the canyon and the sun gods who were worshipped here before the time of borders and decrees. And then the priest came and we were off in a white van that slid into the sky that was washed into gullies. Slate, gray, tarnished silver, then smooth as tarmac just poured the way the 7th of December, 1988, put on the screen with numbers when I was teaching in London and walking King's Road every day into early dark. It wasn't until we got to Gymri and you put it casually over pizza. You were in a shop, class, shaving a hammer in a drill press and the floor started to slide too. The neon lights glared over our faces as the amped up Russian waitress with her green hair spilled coke on the table. I remember the 7th of December, 1988. The Albert Bridge lit up and the tame smooth black as I watched walls come down on the screen. A man carried a child to a gorged out apartment. Three women, 
passed with sacks into the stone dust and became the mask. The neon lights in the pizza place on the square flashed on the window as you pointed out the rebuilt school and hotel and a polished tougher stone of fault line resistance. Outside, we picked up the teenage boy who settled into the front seat with the priest. A medley of punk was a soft buzz of the rattling speakers. And the priest began talking to the boy in medias res about how the body and the soul must find a balance with each other. If we were to make our own destiny, God couldn't do it all for us. It came back to you in spurts, how the floor dished you into the hall, the hammer shaving your hand as a wall seemed to throw you into the street, where mattresses and chairs were sandwiched in crushed cars. Three. I was chewing pizza crust as we walked through the abandoned fields of Stalin's barracks. Under the Soviet eagles, busted windows along the tracks were near East Relief, trains once arrived with powdered milk and clothes for the orphans in the 1920s. We kicked some rusted cans, Armenian soldiers went back and forth at the checkpoints of a new history. Three women again with bags disappeared into the fog along a chain link fence. Four. Memory is like the hammer you use to make coffins all week with your uncle. When you found your cousins under the rubble, they were speaking clearly through the dark, but that was early in the day. On the BBC, some faces moved along the street, the sun lit up, punched out windows of Brezhnev buildings. In the morning, I went to Heathrow to help load planes with clothes and food. In the evening at the pub of Cheney Walk, the TV flashed causality numbers on the telex. Newsband and the voice of Roy Orbison, who was dead at 42, uh, 52, stayed in my head all day. I was blindsided by the sign, 30 kilometers, Ani, where the border slid into Turkey and the open plain was bleached. A few boulders, some cattle, and beyond the 10th century city of Ani, was a mislabeled ruin cordoned off by barbed wire, a river, and some Turkish guards. Six. Between Armenia and Turkey on the shrinking blue horizon, I saw. But what does it mean to say I saw? Just a mind leveraging a way out of confinement of a cigarette smoke filling van? I saw pillars dissolving under the dome of a basilica, some woman disappearing into the abyss of St. Gregory as we moved through the gullies and blanched grass. Seven. And the van swerved to miss some cows on the road grazed a fence. The priest was going on about the soul made flesh and I almost interrupted him to ask, the soul, not the body? The boy nodded as he kept beat to the clash that was wavering from the dashboard. London was a bus so drawn, hard sexual fetish, world warning, the horizon was white air gaps now, a flaking virgin on a conical roof floated in the sky, and then the winds changed. Eight. The priest said to the boy that Ani was the Florence of Armenia, lost. He said it again, lost. And the boy asked, really rifled back as he lit another cigarette, why Armenia didn't have an agreement with God like the Jews did. <laughs> the priest was upset, visibly, in the face, like cold wind hit through the window, and he answered in Armenian. My voice stalled. I didn't ask, what are you saying? Nine, the sex pistols chanted off key like urban monks in leather, the van jolting over ruts, the gray light giving way to fine snow coming west from cars. Byron thought the Garden of Eden circled Arnie and on south, I interrupted the priest. Yes, yes, Byron learned our language, he shot back. 
just a romantic orientalist, I croaked. What? The priest turned and stared at me over the headdress. You think anything is left there after 1915? The CD player skipped on a scratch as the boy popped a can of Diet Sprite, eleven, and said something back to the priest in Armenian before we stole it in a gully and the van doors slid open and the cold rushed as we spilled outside with flashlights. The opaque white light blew back at me, 12. The priest pulled his black hood up, which flashed against the white outcroppings on the plain that could have been sheep carcasses or something else. The banging gonzo drums of time kept playing off the dashboard. Snow came like crazed moss. Um, so yeah, this is um, this is the poem. Um, it is in a po um, poetry book called the Ozone um, Journey uh, a Journal, and it won the Pulitzer Prize in in two thousand sixteen. Um, so first Armenian um, poet, of course, to, to win this prize. What I think is quite remarkable, I mean, there are a lot of scenes here in this poem, but I just wanted to give a little bit more background to Peter Balakian. He comes from a very prominent um, genocide survivor family, actually. But um, what he says is that he actually, until adult age, never really heard anything about the genocide. It was such a traumatic memory for the family that they kind of silenced them. I mean, silenced their own history. And he, uh, he, when, he uh, when he recounts how he found out, he said, it was a bit like my grandmother cooking food and said, oh, we, we used to cook this in the old times. And then I would ask, I mean, he would ask, what do you mean by old times? And then some memories came out. So it's it's a poet, I think, that discovered his history very, very late, but actually lived with the history his, his whole time with that silence, um, that burdening silence, really, um, of that history. And uh, he confronts it in his poetry. But I think he does a really wonderful job of bringing those memories, those old memories, back into in, into a, in, into our present times and um, um, yeah, and uses them kind of as, as the, I don't want to say weapons, but something that just fires you up. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I love the poem so much I can't talk about it. So please, you questions. Are, you are <laughs> you, um, I think um, I'm, I'm not seeing any questions from our audience. Please do send them through if you have any. Um, Thank you for reading that very moving poem. Um, so I, I suppose I've got two questions. One is a sort of um, as a kind of literary buff. Um, do you have a sense of how it sort of fits into or bounces off Armenian literary traditions? So that sort of the kind of scenic putting fragments together. That seems to me quite the sort of 20th century experimental poetry sort of move. But is yeah. that something that would come from Armenian traditions as well? Um, and then there's a uh, that stunning line. What does it mean to say I saw? He's saying I saw, I saw, and they said, what does it mean to say I saw? Um, yeah. Well, it, more than a question, I just wanted to sort of register that because um, it's yeah. so it's it's very powerful and it sort of brings into question both what he's witnessing personally and what he's what he's sort of witnessing through his his ancestors. Mm. I, I think both that, but I think on a more, I, you know, elementary level, I think it's also, when I read it, I mean, it's one of those lines that really stuck in, in my mind uh, reading the poem. It's when you see something, you kind of point towards something that is away from yourself, right? And I think one of the things that he's trying to make, or at least what I understand, what he's trying to explain to me um, as a reader is that when you say that, you automatically move away from yourself, right? And um, and I think that's, that's something that, like Stephen, you know, I'm still thinking about it. And I will think about that line probably for the rest of my life, because there's... I don't know if I find a good response to it, but it, it's something that it op it opens me up to 
myself and my eyes that are in the distance suddenly I always thought that the eyes belong to me but now I see them that they're actually belonging somewhere else in a sense I think that's kind of how I'm understanding it at the moment mm -hmm. um we are we've just hit four o'clock um there's a comment from Nina Manston um who'd like to know Stephen the title of the last poem you read in the author that was the A.E. Stallings I think yes it's in a book called Like by A.E. Stallings and the poem is called Silence. And the book also has a little sequence of poems on that subject, as it were. Uh, yes, anyway, here it is. Good. Like. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nina. Uh, thank you for your questions and comments. Miriam, I'm just going to hand over to you now to, to close. Um, yes, um, um, thank you all for, for coming. Um, this is just a little bit of um, um, a taster because, uh, um, Stephen, shall we speak a little bit about the Silent Garden or the yeah, Silent yeah, Festival? Yeah. So as the Silence Hub, we have some exciting um, news that uh, we, will, uh, we hope to establish um, the first Silent Garden at the University of Oxford. And um, hopefully we will be able to read the poems and other poems in, in, in that garden as well. Um, um, but alongside the Silent Garden project, we also have this idea of a festival of nine silences, mm. right? Um, do you want to say a, a couple of words about it before we, um, we sign off? I was just thinking that maybe like, you know, the King's College Cambridge thing, a festival of nine um, uh, carols and and readings and I thought well how about a festival of nine silences and poems uh, and make a sort of zoom production if you like make at least one as it were closed to a performance if you like yeah mm -hmm. uh, but then open it like we do uh, with our um, group around here called poems I like and why I like them have spaces within which people can contribute thoughts or poems mm -hmm. about silence and then go into a silence uh, and just have a sort of punctuated concert which would include like the the, the concerts that Kate and Miriam are put on you know yeah are, a, a are, concert of, um, of, of poetry I think that's which, it's, it's which, a pretty good um, which includes silence which includes uh, silences um, I think the point about including silence is, of course, is that the poems are always um, are, are surrounded by silence. And there's this one line by, by, by the American poet Jericho Brown, who says, at each line break, you're actually thrown into in a moment of doubt, right? And mm -hmm. um, I, I now, in my own historical work, I always understand silence as a mm -hmm. moment of doubt. So it yes. will be both a festival of yes. silences and, um, and doubts and reading uh, to, uh, to one another. And we hope that you can all join us either over Zoom or um, in the actual silent garden. So I, um, with this, I just want to close the session. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Torch team, for organizing this again. And stay tuned for the next Silence Hub event. And thank you, Stephen, for joining us today. <laughs> thank you. And goodbye. Goodbye. So that